Uh, like with the, you know, Back to the Future debacle over Crispin Glover. Uh, you know, I've been on all sides of that thing uh, because I was originally friends with Crispin yeah. and I wasn't told up front really that I would be taking over the role. I was actually contacted first to be a photo double stand-in for him, uh, thinking in my mind that they needed George at multiple places at the same time, the way they needed Michael to play multiple characters. And I started going for makeup fittings and a, a body cast fitting for the special effect of spinning. And uh, I even called Crispin and left him a message. Uh, you know, I'm up for being your photo double. Will you say a good word for me? And he didn't call me back until after part three came out and he needed to sue because they used footage of him without negotiating. They were going to pay him scale or something. Uh, and also because my makeups were based on his life mask um, and he never gave them permission for that, which surprised me because Universal had me play Stan Laurel and Charlie Chaplin and Groucho Marx, and they always paid the licensing for me to be those characters. Uh, but th I think they were in such a corner, um, you know, the producers Spielberg and, and uh, Marshall and Kennedy and, and Canton and Gale, they were in a quandary and, and Bob Zemeckis, Zemeckis were in a quandary because Crispin was asking for a million dollars and script approval. And they weren't gonna give him that. I, at the time, kind of, when I heard this much later down the road, I uh, thought, well, why not? Because uh, his star was rising. His work in River's Edge and other projects was pretty remarkable. And his first George McFly in the first film was fantastic. Yeah. Um, but they didn't see it that way. And I think the hook for them was the script approval. Yeah. He, I don't think they were going to give him script approval. I, very rarely, you have to be a pretty mega star to get that. Um, but they I also, at the same time, they were not up front with me and telling me it was my makeup artist. Ken Chase, when I was going for a screen test to see if the makeup was working with Dean Cundy and, and uh, Bob Z, I remember Robert Zemeckis asking Dean Cundy, what do you think? And, and Dean saying, I think we got Crispin without the trouble. I was like, what does that mean? And then Ken Chase told me, you know, Crispin's out. I think you're going to be George McFly. And I was like, how are they going to do that? And of course, they did with the old footage spliced with my work and keeping me in the background because the full front didn't quite look like Crispin, but the profile of that makeup looked dead on um, Crispin. And then the old George, I later learned while on set that being hung upside down was meant as torture for Crispin. Uh, mm -hmm. um, he apparently was a pain in the ass during the first film shooting. He had uh, freaked out when uh, Ken Chase trimmed his hair and his in his makeup chair, he brought a, a painting that he and Leah had done in rehearsal, insisting that Bob Z put it on the McFly home wall. And Bob Z, yeah, I got art directors who are in charge of this. I can't undermine their work. No, and you know, it's 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 too late for all this stuff that you're trying to do. I get that Crispin is an artist and one wanted to be a collaborator, but I don't think he was willing to pay or play the power plays that Hollywood had in place. Yeah. Uh, you know, now he's got a great deal of star power and, yeah. and can get away with that stuff. Whereas back then, you know, he was really pushing his luck. And I've taken a lot of flack from Crispin Glover fans. And I'm a fan. And uh, who think I'm, you know, evil. Or a scam. And, and then I've also, at the same time, been embraced by a lot of fans internationally who think, you know, I was part of the glue that held it together by keeping it seemingly that he was in those films, in the sequels. I don't know if you know that Seamus in part three was supposed to be played by Crispin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But they threw it to Michael. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, instead of giving it to me, who's my face doesn't, you don't know me from Adam from any of the other films with my face. Um, you know, so there's a lot of things, a lot of moving parts that were going on. I just got my paradox script out of my file filing cabinet the other day, and I was looking at those McFly 2015 kitchen scenes. And uh, when there's a rewrite, you get a different page, a different color. 
And there's about eight colors in the McFly 2015 kitchen. Uh, in one version, they have Marty in the ortho lev hanging upside down. In some versions, they don't have George at all. You know, it's, it's really interesting uh, because they didn't know if they had Crispin or not, or if they were even going to have George be in. And they needed it for the flashback for George to be murdered in the alternate 85, of course. Yeah. Anyway, they were, production was stuck between the rock and the hard place. And Crispin was uh, duly upset. And uh, it's unfortunate because my friendship with Crispin, uh, allowed, you know, I saw that he was uh, not treated fairly, I thought. And uh, I helped him when he sued. And then uh, he and his attorney let that out to Variety and Hollywood Reporter. And that in turn uh, was used against me at Universal to uh, become persona non grata uh, uh, at other castings, which I found out firsthand uh, from, in fact, the casting director of Murder, She Wrote. I was like, what? <laughs> they specifically asked for a Laurel and Hardy, but not me. And I was like, oh, shit, I've been blacklisted. And so I might kind of find for, my, for both films. I know they were shot back to back. Were you signed for both or? Um, I was I, I uh, was told by Bob Gale while shooting part two that for wearing all the makeups and being hung, hung upside down, and everything that he would find a role for me in part three without the makeup, which I loved that idea. I even made suggestions uh, asking about the Western Union uh, delivery man that Joe Flaherty role played. Um, thought maybe a cowboy or something, but that never panned out. And uh, then I only did one quick day. Yeah. Oh no, actually it was a long day on part three when uh, Marty returns as you know Clint Eastwood from from uh, the, the old west, and and George can't find his glasses. You see me briefly on the big fly patio at yeah. the house. Um, I mean, this is a question that comes up all the time, and you know we've already gotten the answer from the from the creators. But do you think in this day and age we could get a Back to the Future four? Well, I think the musical is kind of part four. Yeah, it rehashes you know the story we all know, but there's other elements in it that will be surprising to the fan, and every fan, and I know literally hundreds of fans who have gone to London and Manchester yeah. to see the musical, and they love it. Then they would go back and see it, and some have gone three or four times already. Uh, and it just day before yesterday won a big award as best new musical uh, over in Great Britain. And I'm sure it'll come to Broadway and it, the States will get to see it. And they got a crack cast performing. And, and of course they had extra time in rehearsal because the production got shut down by COVID. Yeah. Um, so, and the special effects will blow your mind. So it's, it's the musical is part four. Look at it that way. I, uh, there was a gentleman who started the, the Back to the Future fan club, the Hill Valley News newsletter came with it back in the early nineties. And in a couple of those newsletters, fans wrote their synopsis. Is that the right word? Synopsis? Synopsis? Of, <laughs> of Back to the Future Part 4, of what the possibilities could be. And there were some great ones. The fans wrote some fantastic versions of what might happen. And then the cartoon came out. Yeah. And then the, the uh, video game. And, uh, you know, all these uh, offshoots. Uh, Rick and Morty. <laughs> anyway, uh, the um, but the Bobs, Bob Z and Bob Gale have said time and again, as long as they're alive, there will be not no Back to the Future Part Four. Though I had a, a kind of a argument with uh, Tim Ross, Tim Russ, from uh, the Star Trek uh, fame, when uh, this very topic came up at a Comic Con, he said, "You know, Universal owns it." If they decide there's enough money in it, they'll remake it. I said, yeah, but a part four, and that too. You know, Tim would not yeah. waver from his thinking. And I was like, okay. That's but the Bob said. Because <laughs> Tom, Tom Holland from Spider-Man, he said he'd love a chance to, and, I, and again, I, I, I thought I read this, and if not, I, I thought I saw it on a clip that he would love the chance to, uh, I don't know if it was just Play Marty or, being a remake of Back to the Future, that would be amazing. As did uh, Daniel Radcliffe did too. Uh, you know, the, the, 
the talent is there that would love to do it, uh, whether or not uh, the Bobs first would have to be bought out or you know silenced somehow, or dead before I think they would allow it. That's what they've said. Yeah. Uh, not in our lifetimes, as the quote uh, that they said. It's amazing yeah. with you know the technology they had in the '80s to to make that film. You know those films. Like what could they do with today's technology, right? And what's crazy is a lot of the predictions that they yeah. had in part two actually ended up coming true. Most of them ended up coming true uh, in reality. So there could be some um, kind of some jokes on that and, and what they could do with today's technology. Uh, the fan in me is still rooting that maybe we, uh, we could get a sequel. I'd rather get a sequel than a remake. I don't want to see it redone. Yeah, it, it would be great to say, see the adventures of Jules and Vern and have cameos from the original uh, talent. Yeah, jump up. That would be very cool. Uh, I uh, got to visit with, I remember my nephew was visiting from Oklahoma, who was about nine or 10 years old at the time. Uh, I wanted to uh, watch some of the hoverboard scene in the Hill Valley 2015 square and brought my nephew Sam. And I remember introducing him to Mike. And uh, Mike said, Hey, my wife just had a, a, a baby, a baby boy named, and we named him Sam. Nice to meet you, Sam. And, and I realized um, Mike's wife, Tracy, and Tom Wilson's wife and my ex-wife all had, gave birth to baby boys within two weeks of each other while we were shooting, as if we were uh, up against it enough. We had to have babies born at the same, while shooting. And um, so uh, that set, that Hill Valley 2015 set was amazing. It was art directed within an inch of its life. The uh, interiors, Cafe 80s and, and various places that they, were, they knew they were gonna go in with the camera. You don't, the camera doesn't do it justice. The art direction is phenomenal. The Texaco station, the, the Jaws th uh, 3D, it wasn't 3D, the holographic. Yeah. And there was more to your uh, scenes, right? I know, you know, your character came in upside down. There's an injury, but I saw some deleted scenes that didn't make the final cut. There was more to why your character was, uh, was hurt. Yeah, yeah the um, pizza scene and dad's home scene have some bits, uh, a bit more of my work. Uh, pizza, the body cast that I was fitted for worked in that scene in that uh, I was in the body cast, the costume was put on over it. Out of the back of the body cast came a pipe that went through the set with a wheel on it. And when on cue, uh, Lorraine would get the hydrated pizza and say, George, rotate your axis for dinner. And I go, okay, four, ah, 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 and spin, uh, doing my best tribute to Crispin's laugh. Um, and uh, would spin for, for pizza, but the way she set it on the floor and how I was spinning to eat maybe at the table, it just didn't jive. And, and I understand why they didn't keep that in. Another was the uh, fruit, please. Um, I think Lorraine asks Marlene to give your grandfather a piece of fruit and she gives me a banana. I tried to eat a banana upside down and created a comedy bit with the peel slapping me in the face. And that was cut and that footage isn't, doesn't exist. I do have a still from it. Um, but the, yeah, the, I tried grabbing some of the lines that were originally meant for Crispin back in that when I arrived on set, you know, the, the family of Back to the Future talent knew each other. And Zemeckis knew Elizabeth Shue from Adventures in Babysitting, of course. And when they started rehearsing, uh, George's lines were given to Lorraine and, and Marty. And I was like, hey, I could do some of these. You know, I, I try me. <laughs> I'm an actor. I'm studying. And they did, you know, slowly uh, give a few things back. You know, well, you're right. You know, uh, there's stuff with, about, there's a lot more uh, expose about Marty having the terrible accident uh, with that Rolls Royce or the train hitting or whatever. Uh, gosh, I have to get my script back out, but it's all in there. And a lot of those lines were divvied up and, and I kind of fought to get a few of them back, which I did. 
Um, but it was really a thrill to be on the set. I, I, I can't complain because here I was, you know, I've had a few nice co-starring roles, but here I was in a, the high, the sequel, first sequel to the highest grossing film of 1985. Yeah. I had been in the highest grossing Western of 1985, Pale Rider, and of the 80s too, I, I believe. Um, and I, uh, you know, had to pinch myself. I was very, very fortunate to be on that set. 